Good morning, everybody. My name is John Peterson, and more KEA. From the federal government, we're here to help. We are from the newly formed Emergency Communications Division, formerly known as the Office of Emergency Communications. We are the overseers of the OSCOM training program. So that's what we're here today is to give you the latest and greatest. We brought in Carl Bowman from North Carolina, who will be briefing us on how Oxcom participated in North Carolina in regards to Hurricane Florence. We also have brought in Dan Wills, who's from my branch, and he's one of the primary architects of the new communications section, which you may or may not have heard about. So you're going to get the latest and greatest, and then we have a little surprise. <laughs> it's hard to keep, but uh, some of you already know it. First of all, before we get going, the, um, we had a three-day Oxcom class. These last three days, full class. Those individuals that were in that class, would you please stand up? Thank you very much. Uh, the class was described as drinking from a water hose or a fire hose. A lot of information. Okay. What is Oxcom? Oxcom is not an organization. It's not a business. It's nothing. It's basically, it was designed back in 2009 by a bunch of new operators working up the federal government and at that time races and areas were not getting along very well and in some that has improved immensely but in some cases we still see it what we wanted to do is try to find a way to bring the groups together not to cancel them out or anything like that but to bring them together in a training scenario so when they got called up, they could work together under the NIMS ICS system that all states follow. We developed the course in 2010. It was initially designed for three days. However, we got her learned real quick that amateur radio operators couldn't uh, take a day off from work, so we crammed them into 20 hours, into two days, and that's what it is right now. <laughs> it concentrates on the relationship between EMA and the COML, and the amateur radios that support that. We do a lot of planning with the ICS forms, um, how things are broken down under NEMS ICS, what's the best practices as far as working together. Our course down at the state and ECD will support that course by sending them all student manuals, all the necessary paperwork, and at the end of the day we will also print up the completion certificates and send them down to the state. I think we've already covered this. Um, to get a technical assistance request, COMEL, COMT, RADO, OXCOM, you need to get a hold of your statewide interoperability, interoperability coordinator. And if you need to know who that is, please write that email address down at commu at hq.dhs.gov. We will give you the name of the individual along with their email address. We do not distribute phone numbers. The course itself, FEMA ICS courses 100, 200, 700, 800, and a current FCC license. We have only 30 slots per class. It's usually sold out. That's a bad term. It's free class. And in most cases, OXCOM training is very similar to what you may have already had in the past. All of our instructors are considered subject matter experts, and if they're not, we do not let them teach.
One of the other things we produce where we're at is called the aux fog. It's basically the aux com version of the NIFOG. Has things related mostly to amateur radio. You can also get this on the app stores, whether it be Apple or Droid. Just look up Oxfog or Nifog, E Nifog, E Oxfog, and you should be able to find it and download it right to your phones. This is just some general stats, good beer drinking joke stuff. Uh, we've had 110 courses so far, 36 state sponsored, close to 3,000. We'll hit 3,000 before the end of the year. Uh, little known things, what's what the first class was held in December 2009 in the state of Nebraska. Where's John Peterson from? Nebraska. Go figure, right? So we've done quite a bit over the last 10 years, and now we're starting to look out what you need to do next. The thing that comes up the most so far that will be up for discussion with SafeCom and Nixwick would be updates to the Oxfog, possible EMAC, and stuff on deployments. Here's my contact information. It's fairly simple. You'll see this again in later slides. Up next is Mr. Bowman from North Carolina. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carl Bowman, W4CHX. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the presentation that um, we give today is called uh, It's North Carolina Oxcom uh, with comments on um, Hurricane uh, Florence. I want to acknowledge my co authors, Tom Brown and Greg Hauser. These are very qualified individuals. They are Type 3 incident management team uh, COMELs. They are mentors, and I'm grateful for the journey that I've come through, their assistance. Um, I am now a certified Type 3 COMEL in North Carolina, but very much a rookie. So, um, but I'm looking forward to growing from here. This presentation is based on personal observations and opinions from the authors. Please do not consider this as an official communication or statement of policy from the state of North Carolina or from the ARL, which is the National Organization of Amateur Radio. In order, I, want, I have some items I'd like to discuss, um, and they're listed here. Introductory comments, uh, use the abbreviation of OXCOM, which John has covered, I think, very well. I'd like to give some history on North Carolina OXCOM. Uh, we're approaching our 10th year of, uh, of, of, um, of function. Uh, training of the volunteers that participate uh, in North Carolina OXCOM, and then finally Hurricane Florence. This is a map of the state of North Carolina. It was produced by the Division of Emergency Management. Most everyone's familiar with uh, the, the state itself. Um, organizationally, um, it's divided into three, three sections. So we have on the eastern portion of this map is the eastern branch, the central portion, which is typically known as the Piedmont or the Foothills Central Branch and then of course the Western Branch. There's five regions in each area and they're grouped by counties. This is how emergency management uh, organizes and defines uh, itself. It's also the way in which um, NC Oxcom and the HAMS that are working in those areas define themselves as well. As John mentioned, OXCOM has three common usages. There's the organization neutral term for auxiliary communicators. There's the OXCOM training workshop itself. And then I tend to use the expression OXCOM groups for those individuals that are NIMS ICS trained and are uh, working for an, um, an agency, uh, answering to the agency's needs, training to meet their needs, and in exchange they have the opportunity 
to participate in, for instance, ESF2 communications. So these would, th those would be OXCOM groups. NC OXCOM was uh, established in, in 2010. Tom Brown, at that point in time, was appointed the ARL NC Section Emergency Coordinator, uh, and that was done by Bill Marine, who was the section manager at the time. Bill's now a, a division leader in the Roanoke Division. Tom was a really outstanding choice for this position, and I want to tell you that he understood the NIMS ICS protocol. He recognized that public safety personnel uh, had adopted NIMS ICS protoc protocols. They had to, because at that point in time, this was federal and state law. Um, he recognized that HAMS needed to be NIMS ICS trained to perform uh, or to interact with and to be a part of uh, the emergency operation plans that were in, in place at the state, county, and, and municipal levels. He understood where the national framework for emergency response was going, and he understood the implications of this for amateur radio and the future. And I will tell you, uh, as I think more about that, as I talk to people and look back, at that time, 2010, Tom was one of the very few individuals that really understood where that was going. So I want to give credit where credit is due. This is a photograph of page one of the two-page proclamation for the adoption of the uh, uh, NIMS ICS protocol. This was signed by Governor Easley in 2005, uh, and it basically states that we're going to be operating as a NIMS ICS uh, environment. NC Oxcom grew. Tom appointed and worked with great colleagues. He was focused primarily on developing relationships, and I can't stress that enough, how, if, uh, how important that's been for the growth of our program, and continues to be an important uh, component of, of, uh, of any action, I think, on the part of an amateur radio operator that wants to get involved, either locally or statewide, with your uh, emergency management. Um, Tom understood that. He was also focused on coaching OXCOM volunteers for, for roles in, uh, in the communication unit, ESF2 communications, because he recognized that, that coaching these individuals to train, to get educated and to perform and to develop interrela relationships was what it was going to take to be accepted by the public safety community. This was no small feat, and those, on, those efforts are ongoing, and it's a mantra that we continually hear in, our, uh, in, in the training programs that we're involved with. Initially, all uh, emergency coordinators and above were required to complete the introductory ICS courses within 60 days, and that was accomplished by those individuals. A few were replaced, but it was critical to get the framework started. Those individuals were encouraged to take additional uh, NIMS ICS courses. Many have gone on to become uh, COMTs, COMLs, uh, et cetera. Thereafter, any person that wanted to participate in NC OXCOM activities had to uh, complete the basic online courses, the 100, 200, 700, and 800 that most of you are familiar with. At the present time, we have more, more than 830 HAMs in, the North, in North Carolina that have completed these introductory uh, courses. They are listed in a secure database that's accessible uh, by North Carolina Emergency Management. That's the way they want it. They don't want to share it. There's more information in that than just the fact that all the certificates are there, not just the transcript, but the certificates. But there's identification, people are vetted, and, uh, and so deployment is being considered. A lot of that homework's been done ahead of time. More than 89 volunteers have completed the OXCOM course, and many, as I've indicated, have completed additional training, including the RADO, COMT, and COML courses. There are 39 certified type three COMLs in the state of North Carolina. 10 of those individuals are, um, are COMLs. They come from NC OXCOM. I'm the 11th, and I'm applied for an incident management team position, waiting to hear on that. So we're trying to perform at high levels and match and fit in with the individuals that are providing what I think is really important public safety work. At the county level, capable hams are appointed uh, for their community and they're left alone. They set up the public service and emergency response strategies that work for them. Um, and in some counties, this would, would you know, the, the individual looking in would recognize these as a hybrid of some areas in NC Oxcom best practices. 
Uh, they recruit local hams and clubs. They set up their training programs. But critically, they develop relationships with each other and with the local public safety personnel. And that's the way it should be, because all emergency uh, events start locally. They may expand, but they're also going to finish locally. We do a number of activities in OXCOM training. Right now, we're focused on digital communications. In Western North Carolina, portable go kits are used for WinLink training. Each one of these go kits has an individual shares license, which allows us to train the hams on, the, on WinLink using the amateur radio bands as well as shares. The participants that are in these courses also become emergency response personnel under the shares umbrella, which uh, is very helpful. Three or four sessions have been completed, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then this training will move to eastern and central North Carolina. Simultaneously, in eastern North Carolina, there was an NC Oxcom digital group that was established for similar purposes. That training is done online, or excuse me, is done on the air, HF, or sometimes Telnet, depending on uh, what the situation is with not only the station, but also propagation. This is now a statewide initiative with 116 participants, and since February they've been conducting monthly exercises. Training for COMU personnel is a curriculum overseen, as John said, by the Emergency Communications Division. The important thing to remember is public safety personnel need these courses, and they are the primary customers. That can make it difficult for the amateur radio community to get access to the courses. We are very, very fortunate that the relationships developed with our SWIC allows NC Oxcom access to these courses for position-specific training. Uh, John has already mentioned the Oxcom training course. There's no more that I need to add to what he's already said. I will say we are working on more Oxcom courses in North Carolina. I took the Oxcom course in 2015. This is my photograph here at Dayton, I encourage you to pursue that if, if you're interested in getting involved in emergency communications to that point. Every year, actually now for four years, this will be the fifth year, North Carolina has a disaster communication school. This allows public safety personnel and amateur radio operators to get trained. This is conducted at the Charlotte Police and Fire Training Academy in Charlotte and it's two to four days of intense training followed by an exercise. The OXCOM course, RADO, COMT, and COMEL courses, along with other courses, are taught at this event. This year it will be in midsummer 2019, and I think a lot of us are looking forward to it, to its uh, activity. Um, a related courses are, are going on. The uh, more senior COMELs in the state of North Carolina have embarked upon communications coordinator training this was done in January. There were two goals for this. The first was uh, to uh, uh, prepare these individuals for advances that are going to occur in uh, ESF2 uh, and, and the communication units over time, as well as to create leadership depth within the, the team of COMELs. Um, the other thing is, and I know it will be talked about later, but there is interest uh, in our group for the OXCOM Train the Trainer. We would like to teach more courses in North Carolina get more instructors, so we have a, a several, uh, three or four NC OXCOM members that have applied for this course. We're waiting to hear, but we're hopeful that we can complete this course and then become recognized as, um, as instructors for the OXCOM curriculum. This photograph, paraphotographs actually, is from the North Carolina Disaster Communications School in 2017. On the left is the United States Air Force Mobile Command Center one of about eight or ten that were brought to the site where different teams had the exercise. Group photo there consists of individuals that have completed COMEL, COMT, OXCOM, and RADO training, followed by a, uh, an exercise. And on the right is, a tip, is the main auditorium where the after action reports, or hot wash following this, was conducted. Again, a great thing. John mentioned the importance of the SWIC. We have a really dynamic one. He's a co-author on this paper, Greg Hauser. And one of the things I really appreciate about Greg is he meets with groups of hams that are interested in emergency communications. Um, his message is focused on building relationships between hams and the North Carolina Emergency Management. So he's working in the other direction. He recognizes that, that both hams and, and emergency management have shared goals. 
and that is to improve emergency and disaster communications. So that's working really well. And as I say, what could be better than that to be going on in our, in our state? I want to talk now on Hurricane Florence. Hurricane Florence was the costliest, most devastating disaster that North Carolina has seen. We had just come off Hurricane Matthew in October of 2016, and in the summer of 2018, we were just finishing moving people out of the last temporary housing. A month later came Florence. Estimated cost of statewide damage was $22 billion. More than 1,000 animals were rescued, counties and 21,000 more than 21,000 people were sheltered on the night of September 15th. In January of 2019, an after-action report was prepared by the communication unit describing the activities, and I've been lucky to have an op uh, a copy of that, and I want to share selected features from that after-action report to illustrate what the response was on the communications side. You recognize these maps, these NOAA hurricane uh, cone, you know, cone of probability maps. Um, you, when you live in North Carolina, you learn to really look for these on a regular basis. This was Tropical Storm Florence on Thursday, September 6th, and we were really kind of wondering what was going to happen. Well, at North Carolina Emergency Management, the North Carolina Emergency Management meteorologists were not wondering. They already figured out that Tropical Storm Florence would impact eastern North Carolina. On September 7th, Governor Cooper declared a state of emergency, and this now became designated as an incident 2018-0907 Hurricane Florence. Over the next 20 days, the communication unit activated plans, deployed personnel and equipment, received resources from regional and federal partners, and I want you to know that 35 states contributed ultimately to this, uh, to this event, along with untold organizations and everything else. I'm sure there's members in this room that, that were part of those organizations, uh, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, we main, the goal was to maintain communications for first responders as well as for North Carolinians. This was the cone of, of uh, I don't want to say cone of silence, that's the wrong word, but, the, uh, uh, <laughs> but it's, the cone, it's the projected cone, yeah, hurricane cone, right, uh, for uh, Sunday, September 9th. And uh, we became pretty obvious that this was going to be a pretty major event, and in that uh, area was Raleigh, which is sort of in the center of the state, so we were really wondering what was going to happen. Here we are on the 10th. It's still hundreds of miles offshore, but getting more focused on North Carolina. Here we are on the 11th, and then at this point in time, the North Carolina Emergency Management began to put together uh, uh, projections or hazard summary. I'm sorry, I know you can't read this slide. I can't even read it here. But the point I want to bring up to you is if you look at all the colors on the right side of the slide, you'll notice they're purple. That means they're extreme hazards. And so we, Florence, we spent that day uh, working with NC Oxcom uh, personnel and getting them pre-deployed into various positions in eastern North Carolina. It was also on this day that the hurricane track began to change. And you can see that on the slide. You get on the, uh, later that day, and then uh, Thursday, we're beginning to realize that this was going to be an event that came in to the coast, stalled, and then changed directions, and was going to move inland, paralleling the North Carolina-South Carolina border. When it made landfall on September 14th, what became obvious was that this was going to be, the, the, the flooding event was going to be, was going to be, there were going to be three contributions to the flooding event. First thing was the massive rainfall to begin with. Uh, which would fall into southeastern North Carolina. The second thing would be with the stalling of the, of the hurricane and the storm surge, that rain that fell would not go out to the ocean. So it would, it would, it would multiply. And then subsequently, as the hurricane moved inland, uh, which we began to see over the weekend, uh, there would be additional rainfall, so there would be a second event where water, uh, watershed would be filled a second time uh, from the impact of the, of the hurricane itself. The city of Wilmington, a major port, became an island. 70 miles of I-95 was flooded and shut down. So there were some problems. This was the eventual hurricane track. It turned at Charlotte and then moved north into uh, western North Carolina and then dissipated thereafter. This was a major event, as I've already mentioned. From the after-action report, we recognized there were a number of, of successes in the COMU. 
I don't want to spend time talking about this slide because I've got some illustrations of the points that are on this slide. I draw your attention, though, to number five, because what was written in the after action with the report as a success was the performance of the NC Oxcom program. And I'm, I was proud to be a part of that. I'm more proud to, uh, to recognize those individuals that were, uh, that were involved with that, particularly some uh, in, 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 in remote locations. Here's some additional statistics regarding uh, the communications unit response. There were 184 missions that were, that were uh, dealt with. Uh, there were 88 personnel that were involved, 40 of those from NC Oxcom. We issued 850 cash radios into a system that already had um, a, a lot of radio redundancy. Um, 911 calls statewide, 225,000 had to be handled during that period of time. And this is also at a time when 911 centers were moved from the coastal areas of North Carolina inland. We had EMAC uh, resources. This is Emergency Management Assistance Compact from other states. Um, we had resources presented to us, which we needed desperately. We had two Type 1 um, site on wheels, one from Tennessee and Alabama. And we had uh, telecommunication emergency response teams, tactical dispatchers, two teams from Florida, one from Georgia, and one from Tennessee. And this was really important for uh, the response itself. From the also from the after action report, there were some specific comments about North Carolina Oxcom. Resources were pre-deployed at regional communication centers and at local uh, emergency operation centers that made requests. If you recall on the map, I mentioned that we had three separate branches, Eastern, Central, and, and Western. There are also regional coordination centers for each of those areas which had their own commus activated. And then there was the state EOC, State Emergency Operations Center, which was there. So NC Oxcom, uh, we pre-deployed resources at all four of those locations, uh, which was important. NC Oxcom continues to be the first commu resource that's mobilized for widespread natural disasters. And we're proud to be in that situation and, and uh, pleased to provide that role. As I mentioned, 40 individuals deployed at various locations, including work that was done at home for those selected individuals that can do that. The number of non-North Carolina OXCOM monitors, individuals that were monitoring or ready to assist, is not known. I have some comments I want to share with you. First of all, we've had time to reflect on this. So obviously a lot of thoughts and prayers go out to the individuals, families, and communities that were impacted by this event. Uh, as I've said before, many individuals and organizations contributed to the response. And it's important to realize that while the communication unit may be stood down into normal operations at this point, the, uh, the management efforts are ongoing. As I mentioned, it took more than two years for Hurricane Matthew to finally get wound down, and I'm sure that Florence, which is worse, is going to be at least that long. I'm also grateful to the, to the NC Oxcom volunteers that mobilized from western North Carolina uh, to, to pre-deploy into eastern North Carolina, because once they got there, they couldn't, they couldn't move. Um, and go from there. The other thing I want to be aware of is as, as I was operating in the state EOC and began to get communications coming in, I became aware of extensive responses by individuals and clubs that were stepping up to support their own communities. And uh, I don't have any information on that, but I know it's substantial and, uh, and they did a, a good job as well. I want to wrap up with a few photos from this event. and. Uh, um, some photos you, you, you can show and others you can't, and these have been cleared. This is the NC Oxcom room, which is part of the communication unit at the state EOC. Adjacent to this room is the command staff uh, general conference room where the incident commander and others would be. We had many dignitaries coming through um, that wanted to see what the operations were, so we always had to be on our best behavior, which you need to be anyway if you're doing this kind of emergency communications. This room has uh, at least two complete UHF, VHF systems, two HF systems in there for communication. And to the left of the screen is a, um, is a station that is a, um, is a um, shares uh, RMS um, gateway that is attached to the state EOC local area network. The 24-hour center can receive reports from this share station. Uh, and, and be informed, and that's also sent elsewhere. And, and the Oxcom, uh, it's in the Oxcom area. We have 
eight other RMS stations in the state of North Carolina that are part of the SHARES program. This is the, uh, the COMU. Uh, I realize this is difficult to read, but the key thing to remember is that we put a communications unit coordinator in charge of four separate communication units, one at the state OC and, uh, and the three regional uh, coordinating centers. And then we had additional um, resources that were present in one room that could work together. This photograph was shot at a shift change. Uh, this was shot, prop, uh, I'm almost certain, by Greg standing behind his desk. The individual that's seated in this photo is the, uh, would be the, um, would be the uh, night, would be the deputy communications unit coordinator uh, or, the, or the coordinator for the night. The woman seated, as we go around this photograph from counterclockwise, the woman seated is the, um, is the uh, PSAP coordinator for the state of North Carolina, in other words, the 911 centers. And she was there to be in a situation where they could move 911 centers from the coastal areas into inland. The um, uh, gentleman in the gray shirt that's seated in the back is, is, was an interface with the, uh, with the federal communication resources that were needed, including FEMA and others. And then the, the woman seated uh, at, at, the, at the far right side of the picture represented the business EOC component of the state operations center because we were integrating commercial carriers into the communications um, function as well. If you look to the left, these three individuals are seated. The individual to the left is the, is the, uh, is the uh, COMEL of record for that operational shift for the EOC. The individual in the middle uh, from Charlotte Fire is the part of the urban search and rescue team uh, that would be working. And the individual to the right is the representative from North Carolina State Highway Patrol. Um, obviously, law enforcement represented there on the communication side, but our 800 megahertz um, uh, communication system, digital trunk communication system, is under the control of the uh, of the state highway patrol. So, uh, very very nice to have everybody in one room there, and we were directly across the hall, so we were able to communicate with them, free ability to walk in, ability to learn, um, a really great working relationship. This is the incident map, uh, state of North Carolina. A little difficult to see. But I do want to let you know that there were individual small magnets that had group names on it. And I want to let you know that North Carolina Oxcom was one of those groups. Magnets could be moved to various locations so you had a visual ID for the various uh, deployment of individuals uh, that were there. Some of the dotted lines that you see going from the coast inland would represent a 911 center that, was been, that had been transferred and was now functionally being, uh, being managed from say, a county that would surround Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the, I'm, going to, I'm going to hold questions. I'll answer your question, but I'm going to hold questions from here. I apologize. We're going to handle everything at the end. But the direct answer to your question is we've made contacts. The reports are coming in. Recruiting occurs just by virtue of the, of, of the way in which the groups interact. Thank you. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. This afternoon, uh, let me get organized here. Ah. Wow, they actually showed up. This is good. This is good. Uh, my name is Dan Wills. I work for the newly named uh, DHS Office of Cy or DHS Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. It's a mouthful. CISA, and within CISA is the Emergency Communications Division. We're going to talk about that. In a little bit. We're also going to talk about the National Incident Management System, NIMS. How many of you taken a NIMS training of some kind? Very good. You can all leave now. So, so, uh, I work for ECD. I work out of the field office in Arizona. Um, 
many of you actually, strangely enough, I've, I've met in one, one place or another. So, um, so let's talk about incident communications and where we're going. As we operate in the United States, incident, uh, incident management is done under the National Incident Management System, NIMS. And within NIMS, NIMS is not a, 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 a tactic, it's not a strategy, it's a flexible template under which we manage incidents. Um, just emergencies? No, incidents. So if it's a St. Patrick's Day parade or a hurricane, it's an incident management system. It's been around since dirt. Uh, it started, uh, actually had military underpinnings, but then uh, started to uh, uh, develop through the federal land management agencies, the Forest Service, Park Service, BLM, and what they call the LFO, the Large Fire Organization. That's why you see old legacy terms like fire boss and engine boss are part of that. Come the 70s, that started to develop the, the, between the federal land management agencies and the state of California into what is now NIMS, the National Incident Management System. Originally, it was two eyed NIMS, the National Interagency Incident Management System, and post September 11th, it became NI, NIMS, the, just the National Incident Management Association. But it hasn't fundamentally changed since then. So we're going to talk about uh, that in a little bit where we are in terms of incident communications and where we are moving, uh, where we are, where we're behind, and how we're looking to, to meet those expectations. So this the organization CISA has been around in a different format for a while. It used to be called NPPD. I'll spare you the acronyms. By the way, if I get off on some acronym, I mean, we all live with acronyms anyway, but if I roll into acronyms you haven't heard, raise your hand. I mean, we can all round robin and the geek speak and just lose ourselves, you know, but if I move off into something that you're not familiar with, please let me know. So within CISA, uh, the four different components, one is ECD, the Emergency Communications Division, formerly known as OEC, the Office of Emergency Communications, uh, the Cybersecurity Division. Cybersecurity in the United States is cut up into two, uh, two distinct halves. There is a military command for cybersecurity, and the non-military component belongs to us in, in CISA. Uh, the infrastructure security, uh, critical infrastructure in the United States is a huge component that we spend a lot of time with. Pipelines, fiber optics, broadcast, uh, transportation, uh, things you, you'd never even consider are, are parts of the infrastructure uh, division's responsibility to figure out how do we how do we monitor? How do we get? How do we protect uh, many of these environments? Uh, and then there's a national risk management group. So, in terms of what you knew as OEC, we're we're likely the same. We have new business cards, but other than that, our functionality is is similar, if in many ways identical. OEC now ECD uh, rolled up post September 11th, and our main charge was interoperability. Communications interoperability was one of the focuses that post September 11th that nobody can talk to each other. And so uh, we, we got into the mode of how are we going to solve this? So we did what we know how to do so well and we started handing out cash, lots of it. We put grant money out there like you've never seen buying stuff, okay? And stuff like warehouses full of stuff. We're not going to train you or have any policy development or anything like that, but we're going to buy stuff, and we did. And, uh, and for a while, they called them shopping cart grants. You know, agencies literally ran out of things to buy, you know, every year. Well, you know, as we came in and, and, and started hitting the ground uh, with a little better organization, we started looking backwards and going, wouldn't it be a novel concept to train people in terms of how to utilize this stuff, to develop policy and governance, develop exercise, all of these different training environments uh, to actually put uh, uh, this in, into a functional state. And we did that, and we've been doing that for some time. One of the odd things, and, and everybody in this room knows that the technology really wasn't the big problem. If we need to have this radio talk to this radio, the bulk of you know how to do that. Right? The, the technology is pretty straightforward. You know, we understand the technology. Um, the problem was many times cultural. Now, I promise you here locally that the organizational culture 
of the Dayton Police Department is very different than the organizational culture of the Dayton Fire Department. Even within our own governments, you know, that we live in very different places. Even within our own governmental units, we have different vocabulary uh, in terms of how we talk to one another. That ends up being a huge element in terms of how we solve interoperability. Well, as we've moved forward, guess what? The advances of technology have been moving forward as well. So, the, um, uh, like I said, OEC, ECD was created. We um, uh, started in, in the development of the Communit Leader class, the All-Hazard Communit Leader class. Now, Communit Leader had existed in the, in the wildfire community for 25, 30 years prior to that. But it was very fire-centric. Uh, and in terms of meeting the needs of the all-hazard NIMS environment, uh, the all-hazard uh, communications unit leader curriculum was created. And it was created in parallel at the same time FEMA was developing other all-hazard uh, communications positions, command and general staff, uh, the ICs, logistics, operations, all these other positions that were advancing at the same time. So uh, early on in We've had great success with this. We subsequently developed the communications technician class. Again, that existed in the, in the wildfire environment, but in all hazards, it's a different animal. So moving forward with those, subsequently looking down that NIMS chart, uh, radio operators, uh, tactical dispatchers, INTD, INCM, okay, somebody to actually manage those, those operational uh, focuses. But it was all still radio. It was all still working through um, what we know and love, you know, in, in, in this uh, uh, two-way two radio communications environment. So, since the ECD, uh, we had uh, developed uh, outreach. We've done uh, technical training. We've done all kinds of technical supports with the states, the locals, the territories, tribal entities, NGOs. Uh, providing all kinds of specific support uh, to try and move these initiatives. Uh, you know, as um, John talked about earlier, you know, every state has a statewide interoperability coordinator, every state and territory. Yep, Guam has a SWIC. So, it, um, uh, trying to meet these needs. We also have regional coordinators uh, that belong to ECD and that are out here in each of the regions. Many of you know uh, your, your local uh, uh, ECD coordinator as well. So, trying to put this on the ground, a lot of structure, uh, but everything we do has been heavily influenced by practitioners. We've not created curriculum in a, in a you know, a, a, in some academic void. The uh, programs we put together are crafted and put together by people who actually do this work. I know that's unusual, but it's uh, uh, from every facet you can imagine. From obviously the you know, the normal fire police, uh, EMS, emergency management, the military, uh, the, you name it, we've had them in the fold. As of probably the last five plus years, we've actually started looking internally and realizing that our focus has been uh, a little bit myopic. You know, we've looked at interoperable communications. And we started looking at incident communications in general we started realizing that there's a lot of things that we don't touch that we probably should. And we looked at uh, what we call the NECP uh, ecosystem. We're mandated by Congress to develop a national emergency communications plan, which we do every so many years. The 2014 is the last. Uh, it's online. Great table side reading. Uh, and then we're about to issue the new revision of this. But the NECP puts us on to focus of all incident communications and not those things that were simply radio related. So, you know, when we start to look through uh, this thing in terms of uh, where's the call originating? Okay, that, that um, how is that communication uh, involved from, you know, the first person discovering the vent, getting into the system, uh, the notification, the PSAP, the generation of, of all that call data, alerts and warnings. All of not only the sirens, you know, that and, and notification systems we've had in the pack, the, the WAS and you know, all of those systems, but you know, for a great number of years now, we've had to reverse 911 and a whole number of different environments uh, that are allowing us to go back and contact the public directly. Um, even before 
uh, we have uh, a response in play, we're starting to get, you know, how have you, many of you work in a peace app, in a 911 answering environment or have been around them? We're starting to get, you know, with, with phase two 911, we're starting to get through social media, active intelligence, incident actionable intelligence coming in on the phone. Videos, photographs, all kinds of information is coming in on text, all kinds, more than many times we can translate. How do we deal with that? You know, how do you sort out what's important, what needs to be pushed into the field? How do you act on that? How do you validate what you see? You know, all of a sudden, this, this uh, social media environment has created op real opportunities, you know, to see real-time, uh, you know, visualizations of things that are happening on the ground. But along with it came a whole host of problems. You know, how do we manage this? And we were actually ill-prepared to manage it, and that's, you know, a, a big stride in moving forward on that. So, and then the actual incident response. How does that go? Well, you give it to the, the local agency. Well, we know from incident response, especially large catastrophic incident response, that it's not that simple. Large incident response, uh, who gets involved? Yes, everybody. So, um, you know, all of the complexities in dealing with that. So we start talking about this, this NECP ecosystem uh, in terms of plugging this all together. Okay, where do we, in amateur radio, where do we have a place in here? Almost everywhere. Okay, we're involved in public notifications, we're involved in emergency management. Amateur radio's had a foothold in, in, in EOCs ever since I can remember, you know, and in one way or another. I've failed to ever see an EOC nationwide that hasn't got somewhere, you know, a, a, from a, a a cubicle, an office, a building, something else is not dedicated to, to amateur radio support in an EOC. Okay, how do we continue to, to deal with that? How do we utilize that phenomenal amount of horsepower and knowledge there to get into the whole ecosystem? We'll take this a little step you know, further down. So um, just alerts and warnings. I'm not going to go through this thing because it's kind of a complex slide. We try and generate slides that you couldn't read if your life depended on it or if you got on the stage, you know. So, but there are a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot of pieces. And just getting people notified that, uh, hey, surf's up. Something's going on. You know, how do they tell us and how do we tell them in larger numbers specifically how to react? Sometimes that's every bit as, as uh, important uh, than the response itself. We've had recent, you know, the Paradise, California, uh, where one of the biggest mitigating factors was the ability to alert the community to get out because when people are evacuating three lanes deep on a two-lane road, there's no opportunity for responders to continue to come in. You're stuck with what you got. And so in absence of being able to notify those people directly and effectively, wow, we have tragedy on our hands. So all of these different uh, elements here are part of the new ecosystem in terms of emergency management. Uh, I can remember a day, you know, I love the flashy light stuff, but mentally I still live in the octal tube world. You know, it's kind of when I started in Model 10 teletype, and um, this is different. This is moving forward, and it's moving forward at, at quite a pace. So uh, just 911, NG 911, the ability to not only identify where you are, who you are, uh, within a meter or two, wow. There was a day in the backcountry where I live in, in Sedona where it took two, three hours for somebody to get off of a trail and even report something, and another two, three hours to make that response into play. You know, now, 15 minutes after somebody has taken a significant fall, half the time we're talking to the victim themselves, the lat long is dropping in, goes right into air rescue, goes into the nav of the, of the aircraft, and we're in motion, we're actually affecting rescue in under 60 minutes. That's different. That's different than even when, you know, the inception of 911 came along. So, yeah, forward we go. So, NIMS. We have uh, this model that's existed for a long time uh, that's the basic for incident response. And, you know, we look through the bigger system of NIMS up there is you have one incident commander, unity of command, 
you know, there's always one person in charge, not five, uh, and a structure, operations, planning, finance, logistics, new one, I and I, investigations and intelligence is out there. Uh, and then below those are all those operational elements. It's all been built against, again, the unity of command. Everybody has one boss, and we recognize span of control. We recognize a whole host of things. In communications, traditionally, we have been under the logistics section chief, okay? and with a whole lot of other or functionalities in there. And so you had a commune leader who worked directly for the logistics chief, and uh, depending upon the size of the incident, the com communications unit leader was, uh, would have an INCM and a dispatching organization beneath them, and, com and a com tech or techs, uh, plural, that uh, uh, would start you know, facilitating some of that. We started building out things that weren't on the chart. Okay? Radio operators have been in, in legacy NIM structure, but this incident tactical dispatcher hadn't been there. Oxcom hadn't been there. So we started building curriculum and positions against this that weren't really codified in the, in the, in the FEMA structure, but that we, you know, we knew we had that need and, and we started moving forward. So it's many times you'll see positions with dotted lines around them like OXCOM and INTD. One of the other things that have been creeping up is information technology, IT. Now there was a day, I was on a type one incident management team for 10 years, there was a day, if you got radios out to people in a couple of days, they were just happy as could be. If you got a phone out there, oh, we'll have a parade, you know. Now, they set the air brakes, and there's expectations of connectivity right now. Okay? I'll have bids pending on eBay. But, no, actually, we have products available to an incident commander right now that we've never had before. GIS data, all kinds of different tools that are available to an incident commander or responders that we've never had. So all of a sudden, this expectation of information technology is on us. Where are we? We're a little behind. I talked to all the commune leaders that were in the Napa Valley fires in California two years ago, and every one of them had crafted an IT solution to how to get connectivity onto the, onto the scene. Not one of them matched. They pulled it off. They pulled it off because they were innovative. They made it happen. But we didn't have any uniformity how we do that. So we're getting it done, but it's, it's quite obvious that today we're a little behind, and we're on the, on the ragged edge of becoming way behind. As information technology is dominating so much of our incident response, uh, this is uh, an opportunity to move forward. So as it is, as we've had on the right side of this thing, where's my little flipper? The right side of this thing, when we wanted IT positions out there, we'd bring them in as technical specialists. You know, you'd get a, some a high cap person out there that could manage T1 lines, or you'd have somebody come in that could handle, uh, you know, the transmission services or router management, one thing or another. But it was kind of catch as catch can. And so we recognized pretty early on that we've got to get in front of this IT thing. Now there was a day where we had radio techs and video techs and telephone techs and uh, and you know and data folk. I think that was our official job title, data folk. So um, now, it's all data. One way or another, we just don't have analog services. You know, even, uh, even in copper anymore, we're in the digital world. So one way or another, it's kind of all IT in one way. So uh, although we still have a huge carve off in terms of voice services and the expectations that we have in terms of legacy voice services. You know, the people think that we're gonna start fighting fires with iPhones and that everything will be solved by, you know, uh, a, you know, a device in, in, in your pocket. Yeah, that's not happening right away. We will augment incident response. We'll provide all kinds of support in some of those environments. But your LMR radio ain't going anywhere for a long, long time. We do not have a mission-critical device that you're going to affect arrest or fight a fire uh, with. So I wouldn't, don't be throwing away your radios yet. So as we look forward to move this thing, uh, we knew we needed a new structure, and we've been off on this, this bent for a while now. We have an organization, two organizations. One we talked about, the, um, where's, oh, there it is. Uh, one is the national, uh, the, all your state, statewide interoperability coordinators. Um, and they get together as a herd, 
and uh, worked together on policy and training and things for, for quite a while. And the other one is SAFECOM. I don't know where they came up with the term, but anyway. SAFECOM is a group organized within ECD. We have probably 60-some organizations represented in SAFECOM. The International Association of Chiefs of Police, firefighters, the International Association of the Fire Chiefs, the National Emergency Managers Association, the National Association of Governors, uh, the, the public utilities, all the federal land management agencies, all of those, um, everybody, Department of Defense, everybody's in this conversation. And going forward, we reach out, you know, to that group to build experience, to, to you know, draw from in terms of how we create things. So the legacies on the left-hand side, new programs coming in, one of them is called ITSL. And, and as John said, ITSL, we've just finished beta testing and it's on the ground now. It's the Information Technology Service Unit Leader. It's the parallel to the COMEL to deal with that level of functionality of IT services out on an incident. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of positions as we went through to look at this and we looked at other parallel universes like the military J6, other positions that will develop in there, but probably the first and next one to do uh, is what for the moment we're calling ITSS. And it's an IT technician. It's like that ComTech, but somebody that can actually do work uh, in an IT environment. So those things are in motion. Help desk. That's all odd, you know, that a help desk to me is calling somebody for Windows support and somebody that's not speaking English. And no, no, the military used to actually put help desk in play. That, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, help between both radio and IT. The complexity of the average radio we're handing out these days far exceeds the training that we're putting out there. So having the ability to get that kind of support, help desk is actually a thing. And uh, look, look for that soon. Uh, on the other side, back to the legacy side, while we're making these changes within NIMS, all right, we're also gonna clean up some of the old stuff. So I, you know, INCM, INTD, and OXCOM, where all these things were dotted lines, eh, we're drawing in the lines. We're going to make these part of the full FEMA NIMS uh, infra infrastructure. So getting rid of the tentative things and bringing them all into incident management. So what was the, now OXCOM now has a four-letter four identifier, AUXC, you know, as it exists in the NIMS system. So uh, moving forward, COM coordinator. Uh, we talked briefly about that. That's a position that's not ICS. It's MAX. It's coordination, it's EOC or ESF2 level work. And those three people are generally supporting several COM leaders out in the field uh, with spectrum management, spectrum tools, resource management, things like that. So, so a whole host of things we're moving forward uh, trying to bring this incident management organization uh, to meet what's coming at us. You know, you see 5G in the news. Every industry out there Every little niche in the world out there has products being developed right now within 5G, specifically sensor data. The, you know, the, we're about to start laying sensors all over in terms of your roads and your cars. And how many of you have IP addresses in your refrigerator? You know, that most of you have cars with IP addresses. This 5G stuff is going to come out, and we're going to have more information, more sensor data coming at us from so many different segments of the market. What do you do with it? How do you translate it? How do you prioritize it? Where does it go? You know, the, the, the forward-looking technology is going to quickly outstrip our ability to translate it and utilize it. So we're working very hard to try and get in front of this curve. Uh, and so far, we're making, I think, good strides. So how are we doing? Oh, wow, five minutes. I don't know what to do. So those of you who know me know that you wind me up, and I'll talk till midnight. So, um, so this is exciting, and, and it, uh, there are also uh, conversations on do we have all this functionality work for the, the uh, logistics chief, or do we make other uh, changes within NIMS? We've put a group together uh, with all the major players, the, uh, with FEMA, the FEMA DEC, the FEMA NIC, uh, the Coast Guard, the National Wildfire Coordinating Agency, the CAL Fire Scope.
to realign and try and make our systems as similar as we can. The nature of state government is such that you'll never have a system that fits 50 states. But we're trying to get all of them within five degrees, one way or another, a dead center, where you're similar enough to your neighbors to when you reach out for help or uh, you send help to your neighbor, the people that are qualified you're sending are going to have the same level of qualifications and give us that universality. Because we figured out a long, long time ago, none of us, not the federal government, not local government, nobody has enough depth to do this large element incident response by ourselves. We're wholly dependent on one another, and so we're trying to build that framework that supports that. That you know, when we send you somebody, you'll at, least, at the very least you'll know they have one, two, three of these call sets and are ready to go to work. So, okay, we're gonna keep going, and then we'll ask questions afterwards. So. Okay. Uh, com L's, raise your hand. Com T's, instructors. Okay. For all those positions that are NIMS ICS, we have something called the Position Task Book. The Position Task Book is uh, something put together as a standard between states as they train their COMLs and their COMTs. And it's existed for um, COML, COMT for quite some time. And we have been trying for the very longest time to get a PTB, Position Task Book, for OXCOM. Those amateur radio operators that are providing emergency communication support to the state, to local communities, to counties, a baseline standard that would be equal across the board. So last fall, we finally got the green light to start the Oxcom PTB, these are some of the people that were in, um, actually involved with the committee. This one's the development committee. We actually broke it down into two groups, had development and then the review. Now, either the state SWIC was directly involved with the review or the state designated a ham that they trusted to talk for them. So in other words, only people from the state, the approving authorities, were actually involved with this development. And there's some of the names. Oxcom, in one form or another, been around since the Titanic. We've been involved with every single flood, tsunami, earthquake, snowstorms. And again, it's a recommended baseline for all the states. And there's a little write-up that came out of the NIMS guidance. PTBs are a standardized tool for observing and documenting the trainees' performance and are highly used by organization associations and government entities to qualify incident management and support personnel. Again, we had two teams the development team and then the review team. Once that was done, we went in front of a group of a combined Nick Swick SAFECOM called the Communication Task Force, Communication Section Task Force. They're going to change the communication branch. Okay. And when we got it, the committees together, we said, okay, here's how we're going to start this thing out. First of all, there's no rules. Nothing is barred. We're going to throw all your ideas on the table and start from there. 72 ideas came across. There's no task book that has 72 tasks. But we didn't make any rules. We said, we want to start with everybody's opinion on the table. 
So we whittled that down to 20 pages, went into the review team, review team, we briefed them on how we got to where we were going, and the review team, of course, had some recommendations. We tweaked it out, and then the final draft version was done in March. Now, one of the things that we were very conscious of is that each state is unique. What amateur radio support in Illinois is required may not be the same in the state of Texas. Same way with Florida versus Nevada. So we have encouraged for the Oxcom PDB that the states attach an addendum. Something that they can, if they feel that there's um, ARRL, ARRL courses that are needed, they can put that in their addendum. So they can add anything they wish to this task book. They just can't take away from it. What's different about this PTB is that we are using now the new PTB template designed by FEMA. Instead of just the I and the O for checkoff, there's probably 10 different methodologies for getting checked off. And someday you'll actually see it. Again, and something else that was changed is now instead of a task book where you may be asked a question or give him multiple choice or explain, you know, explain the meaning of life, now you must perform the task. In other words, you must actually do it in front of the evaluator. The Oxcom PTV is only a foundation. Agreed upon guidelines based on the state's needs and the state's requirements. The states are the ones that came up with these guidelines. And these are the decision makers for the state. So here's the first page of our draft. The auxiliary communicator, national qualification system. So this is for all 56 states and territories. Now we're at that point in the briefing. I have where I'm going to tell a little story, but not as funny as Dan, because Dan is just funny. So we created the Oxcom PTB. It's been in draft, and it's been through all the channels. And last week, somebody tapped my shoulder and said, well, it has to go to the branding office. Well, the branding office means, well, let me back up. See that CISA logo? It can only be so far down from the edge of the paper. It has to be like centered with a certain font size and certain colors. You know, you have to have certain fonts in the date in the lower left. We actually pay people to do this. So, yeah. So come Thursday, last week, I still hadn't got it approved. It was the last stop. I actually, the tough part was Safecom Nick Swick. And actually that wasn't that tough because we and Dan greased the skids for years. So we knew their number. But it had to go through branding. I can't deploy it without going through branding. So I went on the branding website and it said, Submit your document, and within three working days, we will get your answer back. So I submitted it last Thursday afternoon, which tells me I should have had a final answer by Tuesday, right? <laughs> now, this is the federal government. Whatever happens in three days with the federal government? Nothing. Not even FEMA deploys within three days. Yeah. Um, so Tuesday after, keep in mind we're at the Oxcom PTB, or at the Oxcom class, 
And I'm telling the class, I am like watching my email like there's no tomorrow. Tuesday afternoon comes and goes. And I said a few four letter words. And I said, okay, I'm going to end up briefing this position task book because I promised the bosses, unless I had gone through all the steps and got approvals, I wasn't going to distribute it. <laughs> so that, I knew that was going to make me look bad. And then it happened. Wednesday afternoon, May 15th, 2019, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, approval granted. We now have an official passbook, and I have copies for you. I am not going through this briefing anymore and try to explain it to you. I'm going to give you time to take a look at it. We will be here to answer your questions. Thank you. Gentlemen, would you come up and hand this out, please? If by chance we run out, we do, Charlie or somebody would take the sign-in sheet and put it in the back, and if you will write down your name, print it. Commo people always have the worst handwriting, bar none, next to a doctor. So print your name, print your email address if we run out, and when I get back to DC, I will send it to you electronically. Can I answer any questions while they're distributing this stuff? Yes, sir. There's no such beast. Minnesota might have one. This is the national one. What, what Minnesota might do, and I cannot speak for the state of Minnesota, is they may attach this to the national and have it as an addendum. But it does not affect the national position task book. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, there are evaluations in the back. I've been asked to make that announcement. Please feel free to say what you think about our little briefing. Next year, we hope to come back and bring you even more good news. One other thing, ladies and gentlemen, um, we can send this to you electronically. If you fill out that registration form in the back, Charlie, that's out, right? The registration form, is it out back? Would you put it on the back table? We can send it to you digitally. Also, the commu at hq.dhs.gov address, you can actually write us about absolutely anything to include recommendations that will go into the next OXCOM curriculum. Again, that email address is commu at hq.dhs.gov. Any other questions? We'll be here for the next 10, 15 minutes if you have anything. Thank you.